from it. We wonder why prayer doesn't deliver to our lives what it delivered to the saints. We wonder why the stories about miracles and healing and the grace of God and the appearance of the miraculous appear, uh, seem to us when we read through the writings of our church to be on the one hand very near, very immediate, very accessible, and yet on the other hand very far away and removed from all of our common experience. See, the saints did not treat prayer and the saints did not treat repentance and its attendant struggle as a stopgap measure. It wasn't something to be reached for in a time of urgent crisis. Like the athlete, it was a way of life. It was the mode of being. And that is why St. Theophon the Recluse, picking up on our discussion from last month, when he gives his four conditions necessary for a spiritual life, the last two are to pray without ceasing and to struggle without stopping. How often is without ceasing? It's always. It's everywhere. It's at all times and all circumstances. It's not a stopgap. It is a mode of life. This commandment appears both in the Gospels and in the other and in the epistles of St. Paul, where Christ says to pray unceasingly, and, and Paul also echoes that saying, pray, pray, uns, pray without ceasing, and he says elsewhere, give thanks at all times. So both Paul and Jesus give this command, and this command was a near obsession to the early church. And the early fathers of the church asked, how in the world can we pray without ceasing? Indeed, it didn't start with them. David mentions it in the Psalms. He says again and again, I have seen you, O Lord, ever before me. Your word was ever on my lips. And so in the Egyptian desert in the early years of Christianity, how this could be practically fleshed out and achieved was put to the test. The Egyptian monasteries were a bastion of many things, one of which was literacy. Saint Paphlutius, in excuse me, Saint Pachomios, Saint Pachomios, in his monasteries, in order to enter in the gate, you had to be able to read. And before you could enter in, you had to stay in the outward area and memorize certain long passages from the gospel as well as certain prayers that everyone in the community did, needed to know. If you arrived there and you could not read, you had to remain at the entrance until you learned how to read. And then once you learned how to read, you would memorize those items. And so everyone who wanted to so much as enter in either was literate, and if they were not literate, became literate, were taught literacy. And so the Egyptian monasteries were a bastion of literacy. They taught reading to others who had never had it previously available to them. And Pachomios' monks first tried to pray unceasingly by reciting these long passages from the Gospel as they were going about their manual labor and throughout the day. And they quickly learned it doesn't work. It doesn't work because you have to have conversations. You have to give instruction. One thing or another will distract your attention, and you'll lose your place. And then you'll become frustrated through losing your place, and then you'll lose your temper and you'll sin. Quickly we learned, back in the Egyptian desert, that you could take a short verse from Scripture, a brief line or two, and undistracted prayed at all times. And we began to breathe it in and out. And we learned that we could speak, converse, give sermons, teach our monks, do our chores, labor with our hands, and never be distracted from this simple prayer. And a variety of formulas were floating around at the time. 
In St. John Cassian's day, the formula that everyone gravitated towards was from the beginning of Psalm 69 and the Septuagint numbering. O oh God, come to my assistance, O oh Lord, make haste to help me. But the one that would eventually win the day and become the standard for prayer within orthodoxy, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner, stemmed from that battlefield, from that testing ground. Because we realize that to pray without ceasing, prayer needed to be a mode of being. It had to stop being something that we did. It had to stop being a stopgap measure. And it had to be who we were. So quickly we began attaching it to the breath. Because you're always breathing. You're always talking. You're breathing in, even in your sleep. And so we breathe in, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And every breath became a prayer to the Lord. As it says in our first, let every breath praise the Lord. And we lived that. third condition, the indispensable for a spiritual life. Pray without ceasing. And indeed, prayer can be made this way at all times. It can be made while we're doing chores, it can be made while we're driving. It can be made under every circumstance because it confesses the reality of our situation. He is Lord, He is God. What is easy for Him, what is difficult for us, is the easiest thing for Him. We are a sinner, fine. Have mercy, help us. And that removes the anxiety because we're telling him we need his help. We're confessing our dependence on him, but we're also saying we don't need to know or meddle in what that help should look like. Simply have mercy, help as you know how. We confess our powerlessness. We depend on your beneficence. So, what can we put into our head and still do that? You see, if we're treating prayer as a stopgap measure, if we're treating it like a diet, then we go from one sinful blow up to another. We go from, we go from terrible things coming out of our mouths and gossip spewing from our lips to thumbling around on our gobo skinny and mechanically reciting off the words of prayer. But if we're taking it as a way of life and a mode of being, then suddenly we realize that we can't fog up our mind with lustful, angry, sinful thoughts. We can't let the words invoking the Holy Spirit roll off our lips and also call our neighbor and our brother a fool and all other manner of awful, terrible things. We can't run their reputation down and then say in the same breath, praise God, bless his heart. You see, That ever being present on the mission about which our life consists, the purpose about which we are headed, is the essence of sobriety. Is the essence of sobriety, both whether we're speaking about a digit or whether we're speaking about the spiritual life. The reason why we praise it so that we can get things from God. The purpose of being a Christian isn't so that we get heaven and that we get blessings and that we get stuff from Jesus like he's a cosmic Santa Claus or a universal genie. The purpose of Christianity is not there to make you kinder, gentler, more ethical citizens. It is there to make the possibility of being sons and gods go from mere rhetoric tangible reality. And if we are pursuing sobriety, if we are pursuing holiness, the reason why the drink cannot pass our lips isn't because we can't fumble through the Our Father with 50 proof running in our veins. Anyone who has ever had drinks and seen the blue lights go off behind the nose you can certainly say a prayer. But rather, it is incompatible because it necessitates that we lie. And if there's anything that the prophets, the wisdom literature, the gospel, and the entirety of both Old and New Testament are in concordance with, it's 
is that the truth and praise of God and lies, the native speech of the devil, are incompatible, and we have to choose one. If we are prayer without ceasing, the choice is made. It is firm. It is the state of being as if we read what was written by Elder Emilianos of Simeonope. He says that when we speak about prayer, we most commonly call it prosephi. Prosephi, from the verb prosepho, of course. Prosephi means a prayer, but it's prosephi, pros towards and ephi, a wish. means to send a wish towards. But when we speak about prayer of the heart, about the Jesus prayer, about continual prayer in the Orthodox Church, we simply call it in Greek, ephi without the prefix towards. And Elder Emilia and also Simeon Petra, a blessed memory, for both a year ago, says that that absence of the towards is an indicator to us that some kind of union with the object of our prayer already exists. That we're not simply sending a wish off to somebody, but we're having communion with someone with whom we are intimate. It becomes a stasis a mode of being, and that is prayer. That is with us at all times. And if we remain steadfast in that covenant, we might rightly be called Christians and have a spiritual life. But how long does it take? How long are you on the diet for? How long do we have to change up our nutrition before we can get back to the pizza, the donuts, Well, you see, if our aim is a life of spiritual perfection, it's forever. It's always. It's not something that we're doing for a limited time. It's something that we choose to be day in and day out. And that brings us to the fourth point, to struggle without ceasing. Because whether the alcoholic is bringing the next drink to his lips, or falling into other habitual harmful things, like criticizing our spouse, yelling at our kids, gossiping at our co-workers, clicking around in safe mode on the internet, or any other manner of things. It's a relapse. It's a relapse in something that has us trapped. How long must we struggle against our habitual sin? Forever with our dying breath, constantly, until the end of our lives, as long as it presents itself, we struggle. The story of repentance is the reality that we would love for it to be a whole lot like a diet and say, I've knocked off the five pounds and 10 pounds, it's done. But we bring it right back in. The devil knows that the minute we let our hands down, we forget that he is like a roaring lion seeking whom he will devour, prowling about the world. And when God wanted to create fish in Genesis, it says he spoke to the waters, bring forth fish. And if he wished to create vegetation, the text in Genesis says he spoke to the land. But when he wanted to create human beings, he spoke to himself. Let us create man in our image and life. God and God alone is our natural habitat. And if we can be enticed, not only into relapse, whether to our alcoholism, our addiction, or to our sins, but more deadly into staying down and accepting defeat in them, that is the only thing, that defeat is the only thing that can break that covenant that the God of our fathers has set up with us. That is the only thing that can separate us from it, is our voluntary distancing from Him by remaining down. And so we are called to repentance. How long? Forever. How often? As often as needed. As many times as you fall, arise, struggle to the end of your life, pray without ceasing, struggle without stopping. For the only one who loses in the spiritual battle is the one who gives up the fight. And in 
it may be true that the devil is like a hungry lion prowling, seeking those whom he will devour. But you are the body of Christ, and if we are so armed with prayer, so armed with repentance, he finds no opening to attack. You are the body of Christ. And if we will but continue to remain perpetually in prayer and continue to struggle without stopping, the very gates of hell themselves are powerless to stop your forward 